Imagine an object in a complete vacuum. If its initial speed is zero, then it will simply remain at rest. Now suppose instead that it was given a slight kick and set in motion. Since there's nothing for it to interact with, it will continue to move on forever. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle claimed that this infinite motion was clearly an impossibility. And he used this exact argument to show why nature abhors a vacuum. In other words, a vacuum can't possibly exist. Little did he know that 2000 years later, a brilliant young mathematician would flip this argument on its head. He would upgrade it to the status of a first law of physics and use it as a foundation of what would ultimately become one of the most important works in the history of science. And yet, despite Newton's genius, there was more work to be done. Just 100 years later, Joseph Louis Lagrange would crown Newton's magnificent achievements by organizing them into essentially a purely mathematical theory. Lagrange's theory would prove to be extremely powerful, as it enabled one to bypass the vectors and forces of Newtonian mechanics and instead use basic numbers and energies. Consequently, it would turn many classical physics problems from frustrating geometric puzzles to equations that only required algebraic manipulation to solve. The key equation behind this alternative theory is a quantity called the classical Lagrangian. When I first learned this, I was simply presented this formula as if it just magically came out of a hat. But here, you will intuitively learn where this equation comes from, how it's meant to be used, and along the way, gain a deep appreciation for Lagrange's approach to physics. Let's start by considering the motion of a mass on a spring, or in physics language, simple harmonic motion. It's the physicist's go-to model and arguably the most fundamental of all physical models. We'll analyze it by first using Newton's approach and then Lagrange's. In this model, the spring is massless, the box has a mass m, and the floor is frictionless. According to Newton, the first thing we need to do is to write down all the forces acting on the mass. Then, by Newton's second law, the sum of all the forces must equal ma. The mass begins at equilibrium, so initially there's no net force on it. The downward force from gravity and the upward normal force cancel each other out. If we pull the mass a distance d from the equilibrium position, then the spring exerts a force to the left. Or, if we define a coordinate system, then the force from the spring will be in the negative x-hat direction. The force is given by Hooke's law, which says that it must equal negative kx, where k is the so-called spring constant. This just means it's some constant value that will depend on the geometry and material of the specific spring you are using. So the further we pull it out, the stronger the force is. This will be the only net force acting on the mass. So we can substitute negative kx in for the force in f equals ma. Now the force, and consequently the acceleration, will only be in the x direction. So we can just get rid of these arrows to keep things a bit cleaner. And after some slight rearranging, we have an equation for the acceleration of the mass. Since velocity is just the change in position over time, Whenever we have the position of an object given by x, we can take the derivative of x with respect to time to get the velocity. A common way physicists write this is as x dot. So the dot just represents the d by dt part. And if we take another derivative, we get the acceleration, which is x double dot. So plugging this into our top equation, we get negative k over m times x is equal to x double dot. This is the equation of motion for a mass spring system. Now the solution to this type of differential equation turns out to be an equation of the form x equals a cosine omega t plus phi, where omega is called the angular frequency, a is the amplitude, and phi is the phase. We can verify it works by taking the derivative and second derivative of x. Then we can plug these values into our equation of motion. 
Crossing out all similar terms, we see that omega, or the angular frequency, must equal the square root of k over m. Going back to our position function, phi depends on what we decide to call t equals zero. So if we take our starting point to be where the spring is let go at a distance d, then phi must equal zero, and our amplitude is d. So the position of the mass at any point in time is given by this equation. And similarly, we can also determine the velocity and acceleration at any point in time as well. Now, letting the mass go, the mass obeys these equations, oscillating back and forth across the equilibrium point with an amplitude d each time. And since there's no friction and no other net forces acting on the entire system, this motion will continue on forever. Okay, let's now consider how to analyze our system using Lagrange's approach. With Newton, our starting point was to write down all of the forces. But with Lagrange, our starting point is energy. We begin by writing down the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and then subtracting them. The result is a function called the Lagrangian. This function turns out to be extremely useful, but where in the world does it come from? Now there isn't one simple reason for why this formula takes the form that it does, but there is a nice way to get a deeper understanding of it. So let's take a very useful detour that I hope will give you intuition for why the Lagrangian has this form, what it represents, and also why it is extremely useful. One of the first principles of physics is the conservation of energy. The total energy of a closed system must remain constant. And here, there are only two types. One is the kinetic energy, which depends on the velocity, and the other is the potential energy, which depends on position. When we plot these energies as a function of time, we can visually see that they are inverses of each other. And if we plot the total energy, since it's constant, we just get a straight line. This quantity often goes by the name of the Hamiltonian and is frequently just labeled as h. At first sight, it might not seem like it would be all that useful since it's just a straight line. But it's crucially important in a whole other formulation of classical mechanics called Hamiltonian mechanics, where the Hamiltonian can be used as a starting point to find the equations of motion. But that will have to be a topic for another video. For now, let's take a look at what happens if we instead plot the difference between kinetic and potential energy we get this very nice plot. And as the mass moves back and forth, it follows this trajectory. So the Lagrangian oscillates between positive total energy and negative total energy. Although it's not obvious at this point, it does seem like the Lagrangian should at least contain some useful information about the motion of the system. To see exactly what it's telling us, we'll need to consider the motion from two alternative points of view. First, we'll move over to something called phase space. We'll form a new plot here, where one axis is the position and the other axis is the velocity. We can now represent different states of our system by points in phase space. For example, at the start, when x equals d, the velocity is zero. So this state can be represented by the green dot. After releasing it, the velocity will increase until it reaches a maximum at x equals zero, and then comes back down to zero when x equals negative d. Similarly, we can represent every other state of the system's motion. And if we released it from different starting points, we would just get different circles. This is all really cool, but things are about to get even more interesting. First, we'll move over to squared phase space. Instead of using position and velocity for axes, let's take position squared and velocity squared. The motion now becomes a straight line. In order to make connection with the Lagrangian, as well as to make our calculations even more clean, we'll scale our axes and change the x-axis to be potential energy and the y-axis to be kinetic energy. Squared phase space becomes energy space. 
And again, we are simply representing different states of the mass spring system by points in this energy space. So when x equals zero, the energy is entirely kinetic and must equal h. When all the energy is converted to potential energy, it corresponds to this point. Similarly, we can represent every other state of the system's motion. This line consequently represents the fact that energy is conserved throughout the motion. Every point will always remain on this line. If we had a different starting point and therefore a different total energy, the line would just shift accordingly, all the while keeping energy conserved. Our next step will be to represent any specific energy state by a vector instead of a point. So we will draw an arrow here and call this vector E. If we express each axis as a unit vector, so we'll call this direction U hat and this direction K hat, then E can be expressed as moving U units in the U hat direction plus K units in the K hat direction, where the U and K units are given by the equations that give potential energy and kinetic energy respectively. Now this is just one way we can express the vector E, and it depends on using U hat and K hat as our basis vectors. We can express E in a second way as well. To do so, we define two new vectors. First, one that goes from the origin and bisects the line of constant energy. We'll call the unit vector in this direction h hat, and the length of the bisecting vector will be h over the square root of two. The next vector we define is one that goes in the direction parallel with the line. We'll call the unit vector in this direction l hat, and its length will be constantly changing. So it will be given by some function that we'll call L. And since L hat and H hat are linearly independent, this means that they also can form a different basis for this 2D energy space. So we can equivalently express E as H over the square root of two units in the H hat direction plus L units in the L hat direction. To make things look a bit cleaner, we'll now define curly L to be L times the square root of two. This doesn't change anything other than allowing us to now write E nicely as H over square root of two units in the H hat direction plus curly L over square root of two units in the L hat direction. Now, while the bisecting vector is constant, this quantity L is important because it is a function of U and K. And it essentially can be just a single equation we use to determine the state of the system at any given moment. So now we have two different expressions for the vector E that represents a specific energy state. Setting these equal, the next step will be to solve for the function L. First, we get rid of H hat by noticing that H over the square root of two H hat just equals one half H in the U hat direction plus one half h in the k hat direction. We can get rid of l hat in a similar way. And arranging like terms together, we get this. Now since u hat and k hat are perpendicular, then the coefficients for each must be equal. Finally, subtracting these two equations from each other, we end up with an expression for L, which as you can see is the classical Lagrangian. So here in energy space, the classical Lagrangian is just the trajectory, or more precisely, apart from the one over square root of two factor, it's the function that represents the trajectory the mass takes along the line of constant energy. Going back to one of our earlier graphs for the Lagrangian, we can now get an idea for another extremely important physics quantity the action. The action is defined as the integral of the Lagrangian over some time interval, which means that in this graph, it's simply the area under the curve for whatever time interval we happen to be considering. We are now ready to apply one of the key principles in all of physics, namely the principle of least action. I won't go into detail about this since it really deserves its own video, but essentially, the principle of least action says that of all possible paths that an object can take, 
The one that it will always take is the one that minimizes or rather extremizes the action. In the context of this graph, the principal corresponds to extremizing the area under the curve. And the condition that needs to be satisfied for the action to be extremized is the Euler-Lagrange equations. So now we can see that according to Lagrange, we don't need to worry about forces at all. We simply need to write down the Lagrangian of this system and plug it in to the Euler-Lagrange equations. It's then just a matter of algebraic manipulation to arrive at the equations of motion, which are the exact same we got when we used Newton's approach. In fact, for Lagrange's approach, the principle of least action is the really fundamental thing here. For different physical systems, we plug in a different Lagrangian to arrive at different equations of motion. But for classical systems, the Lagrangian that leads to the same equations of motion as Newton's is the one where L equals K minus U. This is why the classical Lagrangian frequently seems to just appear out of nowhere in textbooks. It's simply the Lagrangian that works when you try to go from the principle of least action to Newton's equations of motion. And in general, throughout physics, the Lagrangian just is the function that when plugged into the Euler-Lagrange equations, results in the correct equations of motion. Now, as we saw in each of our approaches, both the Newtonian and Lagrangian methods for finding the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion are relatively straightforward. But as you consider more and more complicated systems, then it gets to be extremely annoying and sometimes downright impossible to keep track of all the forces. It is in these cases where Lagrange's approach makes things much easier. Consequently, for most mechanics problems, the best strategy is to use Lagrange's approach as it will allow for a lot more flexibility. The recipe is straightforward. You can just choose whatever coordinates you like, write down the Lagrangian, and then solve the Euler-Lagrange equations for each of the coordinates. Thanks to the transformative work of Lagrange, solving classical mechanics problems has turned from complicated free body diagrams to pure algebraic manipulation. A big thank you goes out to this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org. If you're anything like me, you're always looking for ways to improve your understanding of math and physics. Brilliant is an incredible resource to do just that. Their lessons are jam-packed with interesting problems to solve, incredible visuals, and clear explanations that will train you to think like a mathematician or a physicist. Whether you're trying to learn basic algebra or calculus, or dive into more exotic topics like quantum computing, Brilliant has something for you. If you'd like to give it a try, you can learn for free on Brilliant by either going to brilliant.org slash abide by reason, scanning the QR code on screen, or clicking on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given my viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.